So, okay, so um, uh, my presentation today is on uh, the balancing robot that I built. And I've been building this over the summer uh, on a whim, but, uh, you know, um, I'm really inspired by what Peter did there. And uh, I'm glad Peter's going outside of his um, comfort zone. And, you know, he's willing to make mistakes and challenge his uh, boundaries there. And this is a quote from Dean, Dean Kamen. I don't know if you guys know who Dean, Dean Kamen is. He is the inventor of the Segway, the original balancing robot. He's also, uh, he made his money from um, doing water purification on dialysis, kidney dialysis machines. Because uh, the water, when you do kidney di dialysis, the uh, water has to be extremely pure to clean uh, your blood, right? And also too, he's, he's the founder of uh, FIRST Robotics. And that's how I know of them is through FIRST uh, Robotics. So and here's another quote from Elon Musk, uh, you know, and I'm glad, you know, um, Peter's, you know, uh, is challenging himself and going beyond his, uh, his comfort zone. That's great. Uh, um, I, I really enjoy seeing that. And I hope that's, <laughs> I had something, a small part to play in that, but, you know, um, so I'm hoping that these talks I give is going to help encourage everyone to go and push their comfort zone a little bit and take on something complex. And that's what, uh, you know, Elon Musk said. I don't know if you, you know, how many times Elon Musk failed in getting those rockets to go up and land by themselves. You know, it's like the amount of failures that guy had or his company had was just unbelievable, but eventually he got it to work right. Um, so this is about a self-balancing robot and more about these something called IMU, an inertial measurement unit. And what that is, that is uh, uh, something that allows you to measure your orientation in space. So like uh, uh, rockets use that and uh, aircraft use it. The, uh, you know, autopilots still have some kind of an IMU on board. So. Okay, I don't know what happened there, but my screen just froze. But okay, so back in 2009, back in 2009, okay, come on, go away. Yeah, back in 2009, I uh, built this, uh, this autopilot for an RC airplane. And uh, basically what it was, it was, it had uh, gyroscope and accelerometers of pressure. That's a pressure sensor to measure altitude. And behind here was a uh, PIC 18F chip. And uh, these pins were to control the servos to make the airplane turn and pitch and roll and stuff. And uh, so I wrote this code. I got it working. I never saw it through. I, it was measuring, you know, pitch and roll and yaw accurately. But I couldn't get it to control servos properly. So I abandoned it. I stopped working on it and uh, I left that. That's been sitting now for years, since 2009. So since then, the whole IMU market has matured. This came out shortly after I was working on it. It's one of the first IMU boards uh, that got developed and it came out from SparkFun. SparkFun developed this board. They had software for it and they were selling it. And that was circa 20. Uh, 10, 2011-ish, you know, that board came, came out. Today, there's a ton of these IMUs around, and uh, I got uh, back interested in it. It's the drone I built. Uh, I built a drone from scratch, um, a high-performance racing drone from scratch, and that needed these uh, the flight controller here, which is uh, basically IMU and... Uh, a controller to control the various motors. And uh, I bought this little drone here. This is like a hundred dollar drone. And this board comes with a IMU in it to control and balance the, uh, uh, the drone. So back in, I think I got my license, my amateur license in 2010, 2011. So amateur radio, 
you know, kind of distracted me until this year when I got back into um, building drones and airplanes and uh, looking at IMUs. So basically, my radio is down at the bottom of this bomb here, this bomb. This some days, that's what I want to do with my radio. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. It's all right. Okay. Okay. So, so for my balancing robot, this is the build I used. Um, I 3, 3D printed a frame. It's got two stepper motors. I 3D printed the wheels. Okay. And uh, I, instead of going and etching a board, I just did a development board where, where I would put a nano and put my power. Here's my power rails plus five, 12 and ground, and I would just run wires. You can see here all the wires. Uh, these are for the two stepper controllers, and that's for the IMU. I bought the off-the-shelf uh, IMU. They're so cheap now, you can get them for a few dollars. There's the IMU there, and that's got an accelerometer. It's got a um, gyro, three-axis gyro, and uh, I don't know if it's got a, a pressure sensor. I don't think it has a pressure sensor for measuring altitude. So how does this work? How does a self-balancing robot work? So if you take a look at a helicopter, this is the best example. So you've got the helicopter blade turning in one direction. Okay. Now Newton's third law, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So because the blade is turning this way, the body of the um, helicopter wants to turn the other way. So if you turn the blade this way, the body wants to go this way. That's why you need to have a tail rotor. And the tail rotor balances out that torque. And if you look at some trucks that are moving off, you'll see if they've got a really heavy load and they're moving off, the whole truck will, will twist. And that's just because of the torque. Because they're putting so much torque to get these wheels going that it's easier for the truck to spin than it is to spin those wheels. And the gearing, they've got such high gearing or low gearing, you know, that uh, it's easier for the truck to spin than it is for it to spin the wheels. So basically in a self-balancing robot, it's the same thing. You know, if you want the robot to go to spin in this direction, you spin the wheel in this, this direction. So, you know, again, Newton's third law. This reaction does an equal and opposite reaction in the other direction. So if you spin the wheel this way, the robot's going to try and tilt this way. Same thing. If you spin the wheel the other way, it'll try and make the robot go uh, the other way. So by you spinning this wheel, you can make the balance, uh, the, the, the robot balance. So the trick is to e equate the angle at which the robot tilts, either forward or back, pitch we'll call this the pitch axis so if the robot pitches back or it pitches forward the angle at which it pitches to figure out how fast to turn the wheel that's the uh that's the rocket science uh, behind this so basically so here's my requirements i had going into doing this well first requirement was i need to spin the wheels i need to set direction direction and i need to set the speed so with those stepper motors, I have to figure that out. How do I set the direction? How do I uh, set the speed of that, uh, those motors? Next, I need to measure the tilt of the robot, the pitch. Is it pitching forward? Is it pitching backward? Uh, things in yellow are things that I had to figure out subsequently, things which I didn't, I didn't realize I had to do, but it's something I had to do uh, uh, towards the end. And the other thing I had to do was to figure out the turn. So not only did I have to look at the robot pitching this way, but the robot turning, going, you know, the robot turning around. So I had to look at the, uh, uh, how much the, the robot turned around the vertical axis. Uh, so I needed to also set the direction speed of the wheels based on the pitch. I wanted to use a, an Arduino a Nano and a LiPo, and I didn't want to use any libraries. I wanted this to be completely homegrown because that's how I learn. 
is I try and do things myself. So I, I, uh, the other thing I, I wanted to use Platform IO and uh, Visual Studio. I don't use the Arduino IDE anymore. Uh, I've stopped using that. I only use uh, Platform IO now, and uh, it's very, very powerful. So based on these re requirements I set out, I started building, and then these are some other things which cropped up, which I didn't, I didn't foresee. One is that light poles have a minimum voltage. And if you drain the light pole beyond a, a specific voltage, you damage it. So I had to uh, jerry-rig a circuit to monitor the light pole voltage to make sure I don't overdrain it. Troubleshooting was a huge problem with, with this because <coughs> this is very timing critical. And uh, you can't, you know, use a serial dot print to print out numbers because it, it wouldn't work. So I had to flash LEDs and uh, use the scope to trigger pins and do things. And that's how I would troubleshoot that. And so that was a huge uh, uh, hurdle there. The other thing was pr protecting the robot from falling. You'll see here that I have these uh, sticks. Well, guess what that was for? That's to protect the robot from falling because the robot would fall over and would smash its face, right? And all my electronics is there. And so I had to quickly, you know, figure out how to keep the robot from falling over. The other thing was rubber on wheels. So you could see here, you could see there's elastic band on the wheels, but the original build, there's no elastic band. Okay, and those wheels on this floor, they would just spin. There was no traction whatsoever. So I had to go back and put elastic bands and glue elastic bands on the wheels and that became the, the tires. And then tuning the PID, I had a huge, huge headache doing that. Finally, I had to, you know, my no libraries, 100% homegrown. I had to go use someone else's code to get the PID and you'll see why in, in a second. So uh, I'm going to cover off a couple of things very, very quickly. I'm not going to go into details. So the first thing, high level view of a stepper motor. So I've got two stepper motors and I control the, uh, the, the stepper motors based on direction and you could set the speed of them. And uh, basically they work. They have a permanent magnet in the middle and they've, they're brushless. So that's why they've got a permanent magnet in the middle and they've got coils on the outside. So there's no brushes, right? Um, so by you uh, energizing two or more of these coils, you could make the, the rotor here turn a small amount, a step. You could make it step. So you make it step a little bit, turn a little bit, right? And by you... Um, uh, changing which coils you can make the step bigger or smaller and uh, enter in a driver. So th this is the uh, A4988 driver. It's one of the most popular drivers, uh, stepper motor drivers on the market, especially in the Arduino uh, maker space. And so most of these uh, stepper motors, they're four wires uh, and uh, that's what controls those coils. And so this uh, puts out a, a lot of current uh, to the stepper motor. And you've got various pins here that control uh, how much it turns, uh, how fast it turns and which, which direction. So for example, the way that it turns is set by this direction pin. If it's high, this, this, the rotor will spin in one direction. And if it's low, the rotor will spin in a different direction. So a microcontroller would control that pin to set the direction that it would turn. And then there's the step pin. So what that is, the falling edge of a pulse would cause it to advance one step. So here you could see the falling edge, rising edge, then a falling edge. So it's only the falling edges that are, that are making it step. And guess what the time between that falling edge is? That's the period of a signal. So this is just basically a frequency. You're sending out a square wave frequency and that um, period between the rising edges sets the speed of the motor. 
So, and uh, they also have these pins here, MS123, and that sets something called micro steps. So, uh, in this case, by setting those pins, you know, one or zero, setting a, a plus five or zero on those pins, you can cause it uh, to do micro stepping. By default, I use the NEMA 14 stepper motor, which is the same that's used in um, uh, 3D printers. And so I use the same stepper motor and uh, by default, uh, one step, so one pulse causes this shaft to turn 1.8 uh, degrees. So you could set this up so that, you know, it'll take 16 steps to go 1.8 degrees. So that means you got to generate 8,200 pulses for this shaft to go around once. And you could set it for eight steps, you know, 1,600 pulses, blah, 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 blah. So those, those pins allow you to set the resolution of your steps. So as I said, it's the frequency of the, the falling edges that's going to set the speed. So if you plot the period versus the speed at which it spins, you'll see it's a one over a relationship. And this is what causes grief for, for the PID. It's not a linear uh, PIDs are, assume a linear behavior. So you change a number once, you change one um, uh, uh, something once, and then it's the, the output's going to be four times or 3.2 times. It's a linear relationship be between the, the uh, input and uh, output. But in this case, it's a nonlinear relationship. And I tried writing code for this myself, and it caused me all kinds of grief. So enough about stepper motors. So let's talk about measuring pitch. So you could use an accelerometer. An accelerometer measures force applied in the X, Y, and Z places, uh, planes. And it also measures the acceleration due to gravity. And that's what you use to measure pitch and roll uh, uh, with um, accelerometers. You could also use a gyroscope, but a gyro measures a turn rate. It measures a rate. So you have to take the, the output from the gyroscope and multiply it by a time to get the angle. And uh, so you can get um, data from either one of these. And the problem is gyroscopes drift in time. There's no concept of flat or level. And accelerometer gives false readings for real acceleration. So if, you're, if your board undergoes a real acceleration or a vibration, it'll give you a false reading. So the trick is to go, combine the outputs of both of these um, sensors together to get a more accurate reading. And so that's uh, the most famous uh, way of doing that is using the Kalman uh, filter, which is what I used way back when, but it's a lot more complex. The complementary filter is what I use, and it's a lot simpler to fuse the data together. So just a little bit about the MPU 6050, which is the MPU, the, um, the, uh, the IMU uh, board uh, I use, which has an accelerometer and gyro. So it measures uh, roll. So it, it, the gyro measures uh, rate of rotation around each axis here, right? Now, and the accelerometer measures acceleration around each axis. Each axis. So when this is flat, it's going to see a 1g acceleration due to gravity. So the minus g axis will come out and say it's 9.8 meters per second squared, right? Or an acceleration of one, right? It's we say that's 1g, right? So it'll, it'll measure minus 1g. So the way this works is that uh, if you look at uh, a rotation around the y, the x-axis, so I'm going to rotate this thing around the x-axis here. So I'm going to flip this end comes up, that end comes down. So I'm rotating around the, the x-axis. So the plus z-axis moves and it's over here, and the minus y-axis comes up here. This is called my pitch. So, and that's what the accelerometer will give you. It'll give you that angle. Same thing with the, uh, if I measure a rotation around the y-axis, my x-axis comes up, my z-axis, sorry, 
will come over here and my x-axis comes up here. And as well, the gyro, in this case, the gyro will give the roll rate uh, around the x-axis. And in this case, the gyro will give the roll rate around the y-axis. Enough said about uh, how these things work. So the mounting that I have on my um, robot is I have it mounted upside down. So here is the IMU, this is the uh, MPU 6050 here. The plus set axis is coming up this way, but here I'm looking, looking up at the robot. So the robot's upside down here. This is upside down. This is the robot looking down. You can see this is mounted upside down. So the minus Z axis is coming up. Minus The plus Y axis is here. And the plus X axis is coming out of the page. So that caused me a little bit of grief to figure that out. Um, but to, to get the angle, it's just you're using trig trigonometric, uh, like high school math, like you're just using trig to, to, to get the angle. Uh, you're looking at that rotation, you know, about uh, the, for example, the Y axis, uh, you could use trig and you could figure out what that ang angle is. And that's what I'm doing here. I won't get into that. Same thing with the gyro. The gyro gives spits out a value around the Y. If I multiply that by the time between my measurements, it'll give me the actual angle. So for example, if I make a measurement every four milliseconds, I just have to multiply this, the number that's spit out by the gyro by four milliseconds, and it gives, gives me the angle. So that's it. That's all I, I want to talk about that stuff. Um, so Here's the code. I'm not going to go th go through the code, but uh, basically, I am uh, sampling the um, that board every four milliseconds. There is a uh, interrupt that uh, goes off, and it uh, sets a flag. And I go through and I read the MPU 6050. I figure out the time between my values, and I, I compute the values. And then I compute my PID and I spit out the PID to the wheels to make the wheels spin. And this is how I calculate uh, uh, the various pitch and uh, uh, accelerometer angles and gyro angles. So here's the first test um, that I did. Uh, I've got it wired up. I finally got the MP working. And so this is the first test I did of just making sure that it's, uh, it's actually working properly. So right there, it's spitting out the angle, the pitch angle, and it's coming out zero for all intents and purposes. So now I put it at a 45 degree angle and see it's spitting out 46, 47 degrees, close enough to, to 45 degrees. That's not bad, that's pretty good. So next, I had to figure out how to get the stepper to work. So um, uh, that was a real pain in the butt. So I had to interrupt, go off every 20 microseconds. And uh, that I would uh, have a counter to count how many pulses I would have or, or what the delay between the pulses is. So that would be the period between pulses. So I had a, uh, every 20 seconds, I would, uh, count like five, so 100 microseconds, and I'd pulse the, uh, uh, the step control, and I'd set the, the direction. And so this here is uh, a little test program I wrote to, to, to get the uh, stepper motor working. So there you can see the wheel spinning. And then I do a more aggressive test where I, I do random steps. And you can see the wheels, they're randomly going in different uh, directions here. Are you guys seeing this? That's okay? 
Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So the next step was the PID. So I was able to measure angle. I was able to spin the wheels. Now, how do I marry it uh, together? So uh, a PID is a proportional integral deriv derivative uh, controller. It's a feedback controller. So basically what it is, you take uh, some kind of sensor input. So you take some value, you take a set, a set point of where you want that value to be, and you calculate three terms, a proportional term, an integral term, and a derivative term. You sum it and you feed your controller that. So in the case, suppose my angle, I'm getting my pitch angles coming in and saying it's plus 10 degrees, but I want a pitch angle of zero. So I've got, they call it the error. I've got an error of 10 degrees. So I've got a pitch angle of 10. I want zero coming in, my set point zero. And so I've got an error of 10. I feed that into a proportional term, an integral uh, calculation and a derivative calculation. So the proportional, proportional term is very straightforward. It's just the error, the difference between the set point multiplied by a constant. And so this is proportional. So this makes the robot get a real jerky, or if you use a proportional term alone in your PID, you get very jerky move movements because you're, it's, it's as good as this uh, um, constant here and of magnitude of uh, the error. The integral term is you're taking the sum of all your errors and you're multiplying it by another constant. So what this does, think about the, the integral term, is if your proportional term says, spin the wheel this much, but the robot is not moving, it's not writing itself, and it's staying at that level. Well, the, the integral term will measure the sum of that error over time, and it makes the controller output bigger. So it makes it, it, it accelerates um, the uh, correction. And the derivative does the opposite. So it's looking at the difference in the, uh, in the error terms, multiplying that by a constant. So this term kind of smooths out that jerky motion. So if you've got the robot really jerking back and forth, then by adjusting this constant here, you smooth, smooth, smooth it out. So that's kind of, you know, a very high level view of a, of a PID controller. And here's, here's how I integrated the PID. And uh, this, okay, this is the original code I used, and you'll see the original code I used working. This is not the code I used. So, um, I used uh, code from this guy, uh, Jupe uh, Broking. And because uh, what he did, he did a nonlinear, he figured out how to do a nonlinear uh, PID uh, for um, uh, calculating the, the step rate for the, uh, for the motor. So the core PID, you're just looking at, you know, you're getting your pitch error and you're looking at the pitch and the set point what, what the, uh, the IMU is measuring, what you're supposed to want, and this is just a correction point that I, I had to add, add in. And here's the P term, the pitch error times the uh, constant KP. Uh, here's the integral term, I'm summing it over you know, all the errors. And then uh, the uh, D term is just I'm taking the derivative, the difference between the two terms. And here's my sum. And I calculate my PID, I feed it in here. And this then figures out the pulse frequency that uh, I need to send to that 20 microsecond interrupt. So enough said about that. So here, here's the original code I had, and I call this the horror. So this is the kind of stuff that uh, um, happened to the robot as I was trying to figure out how to get that PID controller working. So the robot would just go off on its own and would fall down. Notice the sticks I had to get, I had to put in there to make sure the robot wouldn't kiss the pavement, kiss the floor. 
So this, you know, it would start to work. Sometimes it would work, then it would start moving. And, and notice the oscillation, how much it oscillates there. That's uh, because of that uh, P term. So this this went on for hours and hours and hours, trying to tune the uh, the PID controller. So this is the code. This is running the code I developed. And sometimes this would happen. In this specific case, what had happened? I didn't realize it was one of the uh, PID um, connectors got unplugged from, from the motor. So the, the cable connecting to the motor became unplugged. That's why one motor is not moving. But it turned out to be great because it was able to balance really well with one motor. So enough of that. And then finally, this is my code. I was able to get it to balance, but what I couldn't get it to do was to drive forward. So th this is my code. I, I finally managed to get the PID working. It was very jerky. It wasn't very smooth. And you can see it's oscillating a, a little bit there. Well, it's oscillating quite a bit. And if you push it, 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 it self-balances itself. That's a real test. Are you guys seeing this okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. And uh, periodically, it, was, it would drive forward and back. And that's just part of the PID uh, controller I wrote. It wasn't very uh, efficient. It worked. It would balance. So at this point, you know, I could have just said, hey, it's working. I got it working. And I met all of my, my conditions. But uh, it, uh, I wanted to, you'll see later on, I wanted to get it to drive forward. So now uh, here again, this is now this uh, later later in the video you'll you'll hear hear my son laughing because he says uh, that robot's having a seizure because as soon as I got it working I took it up to my son's room and I'm going hey Tyler look it's working now see how it's how it stops and it balances perfectly no oscillation that's because the rug the grooves in the rug. It's got a little groove in the rug and it's just making it stand still. So it just happened. It's not the code keeping it that still, it's it's the rug. So again, this is using my code. You, you can hear my son laughing there in the background. Yeah. And then, uh, so what I did uh, as a test, I was playing around with uh, KiCad and I wanted to learn how to send a board off. So I went and I got a board made for this and uh, I sent it away to JLPCB and uh, came back, it was about six bucks to get five boards. I sent the uh, Gerbers away Got it bad. I got it back, plugged in, soldered in all the port, all the parts, and it worked perfectly. Here's a test, the first test of the board. I 
I didn't have to change a thing. It worked perfectly. The only thing I, I had to do was I had to recalibrate it so it knows uh, what direction it was up in. So then the next step was I got, uh, I saw these sensors. These are ultrasonic sensors. And I had visions of the Mars rover and I'm going, ooh, I wonder if I can make a, a rover. So the way these ultrasonic sensors work, there's a transmitter and a receiver. It sends out a sound pulse. It hits the walls, come back, and it measures the return time. So it measures the time it takes for the pulse to go out, the pulse to come back. It knows the speed of sound and it can determine the distance from a wall. So here you would trigger, you generate a trigger signal for 10 microseconds. It, it sends out a bunch of pulses out. It measures it coming back and then it raises another a line called the echo line. And that line, it raises it the, the uh, period, the, the, uh, the time, uh, the, the duty cycle of that uh, pulse is um, proportional to the distance. Uh, twice the distance because it's the return. It's the time to go there and the time to come back. So you have to take this and divide by two to get the distance going there. So I uh, wrote some code uh, to get it done. I uh, uh, this is I use my four millisecond uh, timer to generate to say okay make a measurement. I use my twenty mil, uh, microsecond timer to to toggle the uh, the pins, um, the uh, that pin that 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 you know has to come up for ten uh, microseconds to say take take a reading, and then I have a interrupt driven uh, on the pin on that echo pin, and I measure the the pulses, the uh, the microseconds between the time the uh, the pin is high and the time the pin is low, and then I calculate. Here's the formula. I use notice I have to divide by two, the pulse width divide by two, and I make some calculations. And in this, if the distance is um, less less than 40, then I stop, I stop the robot. So, and I think this is the last video I've got. So, so basically the robot's gonna drive forward, it checks the distance using the ultrasonic sensor. If the distance is less than, I think it was, uh, is it 40 here? It's 40, so it's not, uh, this, this should, be, should be saying 40. If it's less than 40 uh, centimeters distance, stop. The robot stops, and then it turns approximately 90 degrees. That's where I have to measure the rotation. I have to use the gyroscope to measure the, the rotation to try and get it to turn 90 degrees. It pauses, it stops, pauses, and then it, it goes forward again, and it... Uh, it uh, repeats. Now, this code is running the jupe broken PID code. And you'll see, you'll clearly see how much more smooth the robot runs. I could not get this to work using my code. So I had to throw myself on a sword and say, look, you know what? I have to get help here. So if you look at this video, you'll see So there it is driving forward, and you'll see how smooth it's driving. Now, the reason why it's it's speeding up and slowing down is because the speed control is like a PID controller. There it's turning 90 degrees, or it's trying to turn 90 degrees. Um, it speeds up and slows down because the speed controller is kind of like a PID, but I only have a proportional term. So you'll see it's speeding up and slowing down. If I wanted to do this right, I'll do a proper PID to control the speed. So I put my hand in front, it stops, and it turns 90 degrees. Then it pauses, and you'll see it, it oscillates just a tiny little bit. It's not much of, much of an oscillation. So Jupe's uh, um, PID controller is, works real, really well. See, and I stop it again, it turns 90 degrees, pauses.
then it's rinses, it dries forward, sees my hand, it stops, turns, turns 90 degrees, pauses. Now look at the line in the floor here and you'll see how well it's tracking. So you see it's not tracking very straight, right? The wheels are not spinning evenly and it, it's probably not at 90 degrees to the wall, right? So you know, it turns, I was really impressed there. That was almost 90 degree turn. So it hits this wall, stops, turns, and that's it. So uh, that's the end of that.